it's a kind of spiritual experience for uh, somebody like me to have the opportunity to sort of see what a Latter-day Saint temple is like. When it comes to the temple, I think one of the ideas is that a person who comes into the structure is supposed to be overcome spiritually, to feel that he or she is literally the presence of God. at the emphasis the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints places on its temples and puzzle at their purpose. I am both interested and delighted to see so much of ancient religious tradition, particularly biblical tradition, taken up into uh, the religious structures and rituals of the Mormons. Both the origin and the highest definition of joy in Jewish tradition is the temple. And a lot of that is done by a combination of two things, aesthetics, the beauty of the place, and symbolism. The temple, I think, is the great metaphor on earth for what heaven will be like. All of these symbols are designed to evoke in the person this spirituality, really, and the feeling that a human being can attain closeness to God. I find in Mormonism, in its renewing the temple perspective and in its uh, transcending, breaking through, making porous the wall between time and eternity. So it speaks to me as something good to hear about. The idea of temples is not new. The Old Testament account includes many references to temples. Adam, according to the Genesis account, is prompted after the fall to pray, but we read that he prays at an altar. And that can be the earliest definition of what a temple is. Somehow it is an altar to which one comes to offer himself or as later a sacrifice of some kind and thus commune with God. The Lord appeared to Adam and he said to him that he should build an altar and that he should bring forth and perform sacrifices upon that altar and that these sacrifices were a similitude of the only begotten Son of the Father. Now that is the key. The idea of obedience and um, aligning oneself with God was present in Adam. And the angel says, you're doing this in similitude of the only begotten Son. And then he begins to understand that sacrifice and altars have to do with Jesus Christ. So here is the Messiah idea in the initial stages of human history. And here is an altar as a place for communing with God. Within ancient Judaism and in the biblical period, the idea of a temple is it's a special place where God's presence is always to be found. Temple was was the uh, house of God. It was where the divine and the human touched. The earthly temple is the counterpart of the heavenly temple. There's a linkage notion that somehow the temple in its proper position is a connection between earth and heaven. God is there. He has made this the indwelling of his presence, as we call it. And therefore, when we wish to feel that presence, to communicate with that presence, all we have to do is enter into that specially holy place. And in Judaism, some part of that is rubbed off on the synagogue, but it's generally understood that the real presence of God dwells at a much higher level, you might say, in a temple structure. After delivering the children of Israel from bondage in Egypt, the Lord commanded Moses to build a portable tabernacle, a type of temple to be used during their journey in the wilderness. From the point of view of their understanding, they had left Egypt under God's leadership. They had received his law, and the first thing to do was to build even this portable shrine. 
is a means by which one communicates with the deity. It's called the Temple of Meeting or the Temple of Council. And you remember Moses went to the tabernacle to receive revelation from the deity. The tabernacle of Moses was made of the finest, most prized, and costly materials available. The tabernacle was largely symbolic and was the prototype for the great temples built later by the kings of Israel. The only entrance was through a gate in the east wall, which led to the outer courtyard. Here, in front of the tent of the tabernacle, burnt offerings were made to the Lord on the altar of sacrifice, and priests washed at the laver to prepare for temple ordinances. The purpose of the laver, which is a wash basin really, is to make sure that the priests ritually wash their hands. In order to do the rituals, even having immersed before you come into the temple, you gotta wash your hands as part of the process, and your feet, by the way. There were several different kinds of sacrifice, but the primary sacrifice was one of atonement, one to reach atonement with the deity. And the person bringing the sacrifice to be killed, the animal to be killed, laid his hand on the top of the animal's head, making the animal proxy for his sins. Sacrifice is a symbol. It, 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 it is a similitude of the ultimate sacrifice, that of the Savior, Jesus Christ, of his one-time sacrifice by which he shed his blood for the benefit of all of us. The redemption effect of sacrifice as uh, it becomes manifest in Christ is that he becomes, as it were, the high priest who represents the whole family of man. And in this case, instead of there being any other living thing which submits to death, he himself does. And by that act, vicariously takes upon himself the transgressions of mankind and blots them out. So he is the redeemer in that sense. He is also the atoner, and he is, in Christian language, the savior, making possible a whole new life in the presence of God. There were two rooms in the tabernacle. The first room was called the holy place and contained three sacred objects, the menorah, the showbread, and the altar of incense. The menorah symbolizes the divine presence as light. And here you have the idea that there is a light which must be burning all the time. The symbolism is the light of God. This is his house. This is the place where he would meet his people and the light would be essential to that symbolism. Well, they have this thing called showbread, written in the old Bibles and in the King James as shewbread, S-H-E-W. The, the Israelites knew God didn't eat anything. But by giving them the, these beautiful breads, eventually shared with the, the priest, it was kind of a showing that we want to give the best of what we have to, uh, to eat to the God. There are 12 loaves, and I suppose, again, it's representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Incense offerings, again, are part of the cult of all of the ancient Near Eastern uh, religions. Symbolically, it was understood to indicate that something which we lit, that is to say the incense, which again represented an offering to God, would go straight up to heaven. That had some symbolic um, reference to the prayers that were offered there ascending to heaven to the ears of God. It brings a sweet savor to heaven. It is a gift appropriate to give to deity, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We do not burn incense in our modern temples, but prayers are offered in the temples with the intent that they would reach also to the presence of deity and find response there. There was in the temple a particular curtain or veil which sealed off the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple. The veil of the temple was symbolic as well because that thin veil was the only thing between you and the Holy of Holies. There you have the Ark of the Covenant, the agreement binding Israel to its God and God to Israel. It is a throne room. And it is, again, the equivalent of the heavenly throne room where the deity himself actually 
dwells and sits. Inside the Ark of the Covenant were kept other sacred objects, including the stone tablets of the law given to Moses on Mount Sinai. This room represented being in the presence of God, and the tablets of the law constantly reminded Israel that their return to God was based upon obedience to his laws. After the children of Israel were established in the Holy Land, the great King David desired to build a permanent temple. He began to obtain the finest building materials, but it was his son, Solomon, who was permitted by God to actually build the magnificent temple in Jerusalem. At Solomon's temple, they had the sea, they called it, on the back of 12 oxen. Another similarity to our modern temples in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. 12 is always the proper symbol in Israel. The laborers also call the sea in Biblical Hebrew. It is used particularly, though, for the priests making themselves clean. It is related, if you wish, therefore, ultimately to baptism. Each of them has a baptismal font, in this case, on the backs of 12 oxen, which would be very much like Solomon's temple. After many generations of political and social upheaval, the great temple in Jerusalem fell into decay. Herod, the king of Judea, reconstructed the temple 16 years before the birth of Christ. It was to this temple that Christ came during his mortal ministry. It's obvious that Jesus and his family went to the temple. His parents brought him there. He is found there uh, talking with the learned men at a young age. And then much of his most impressive teaching is given within the general confines, the outer courts of the Temple Mount. At the crucifixion of the Savior, the scripture records that the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. In the temple was that place which was regarded as the Holy of Holies, and it was separated from the world by a veil. And when Christ was crucified, that veil was rent, as the scriptures say, from top to bottom meaning symbolically that uh, he had passed through the veil. Whatever used to be is God. Whatever was has been rent asunder. The old law, as valuable as it was, as important as it was, Christ himself always observing it, he didn't come to destroy the law, came to fulfill it. Well, now it was fulfilled. The rending of the veil in the temple, it seems to me, was symbolic of that barrier between mortality and eternal life being broken forever, and the freedom and the opportunity given to all mankind now to pass through that veil and return to the presence of God. The temple was later destroyed by the Romans in the conquest of Jerusalem under the Emperor Titus. It was never rebuilt. In antiquity, of course, a temple with its altars and its uh, big basins for illustrations and the Jerusalem temple was a place where you went to uh, carry out holy acts, sacrifices and the like. And uh, I feel that uh, the Mormon experience of the temple has sort of restored that meaning to the word temple. If you understand why we build temples, you must understand first that uh, we believe in revelation and in the restoration of the gospel. And to restore means to bring back something that was lost, not a new invention, but uh, a restoration of that which is, uh, was known anciently. Following the time of the Savior's life upon the earth, there were changes in religious belief and practice which were instituted among mankind, and the purpose and the place of temples was lost. That purpose was restored to the earth through the prophet Joseph Smith when the gospel of Jesus Christ was restored in its fullness. Historically, it is fascinating to note that even before the Mormon people 
began to look about for land for a possible meeting house or chapel. They simply continued to meet typically in homes or in out of doors locations and began that early to look for a place for a temple. In the early days, when the revelations first came that they were to build a temple, I suppose they didn't really know why, but they knew what. So when uh, the church was established in Kirtland, they began the work of building the first temple in this dispensation. The Kirtland Temple was a magnificent structure, maybe not so much from today's perspective in terms of a huge building, but when we think that the people who lived in the Kirtland, Ohio area were living in log cabins and the saints chose to build their temple of stone, not of lumber, not of logs, but of stone. It represented their feelings that it should be a substantial building and one worthy to be called the house of the Lord. I still weep in reading of the sacrifice that went into building that first little Kirtland temple, uh, which uh, had to be abandoned. We actually had a temple in 1836, a preparatory temple, uh, which we call the Kirtland Temple, which still stands before we had any meeting house. And it was at that time a kind of multi-purpose building and the understanding of the full, what we call the full temple blessings was not clear at that point, but became clear later in Nauvoo in the 1840s. So the first temple that had within it all of the patterns and practices of covenant making, uh, the first temple of that kind is in Nauvoo in 1844, and Joseph Smith did not live to see it completed. The Nauvoo Temple, built on a bluff overlooking the majestic Mississippi River, was the crown jewel of the community. But increasing persecution forced the Latter-day Saints to abandon their beautiful city with its temple, which burned at the hands of an arsonist. Under the dynamic leadership of Brigham Young, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints abandoned their homes in Nauvoo and trekked over 1,300 miles west to settle in the valley of the Great Salt Lake. Almost immediately after the weary pioneer refugees arrived in the valley, Brigham Young surveyed the area and finding a suitable spot, plunged his cane into the ground and declared, here we will build the temple of our God. Constructed of the highest quality materials they could obtain and employing the very best of their craftsmanship, building the temple proved to be epic in scope, taking 40 years to complete. Thank you. 
now stands as a magnificent monument to pioneer dedication and determination to build a sacred temple worthy to bear the inscription, the House of the Lord. There's no question that there's a continuity between ancient temples and modern temples. The difference between those ancient temples and the temples we have today is the difference between uh, the preparation and the fullness. Anciently, sacrifices were performed in the temple. It was a, a ceremony and an ordinance that was carried on really from the beginning, from Adam and Eve until the ministry of Christ, when in him all sacrifices were done away with. The teaching and the focus on Jesus was uh, kept alive and kept uh, active and vibrant and powerful long before he ever came in the flesh uh, so that uh, every generation would understand what he was going to do, even those who preceded him. They would understand that the day would come that he would be sacrificed for their redemption, for their sins, for their salvation. Today we speak of a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Well, that's, that's another similitude, that's another s symbolic statement about the Savior. So the form of the sacrifice has changed down through time, but the meaning has always been Christ. The focus has always been on the Savior of the world. When you enter the temple, time is behind you. You've left it at the door. And you walk into eternity. From the minute we walk in the door until the concluding hour when we walk out, everything there takes on this eternal grandeur. The temple is in many ways a school. And it teaches about life, teaches us where we came from, why we're here and what uh, our possibilities are. And you get this grand sweep, this wonderful portrayal, the greatest portrayal ever. I mean, uh, th th it's the best teaching we can do in this church about uh, God's plan for us and what happened before we came to this earth and the purposes now that we're here, and what will happen and what our possibilities are and what our capabilities and promises are after this life. Marriage is so central, so fundamental to everything that we know and understand in the gospel. We enter into an eternal or a celestial marriage and know that our family will be together forever, ultimately. In many of the temples, there will be mirrors on each side of the room. And if you stand between the mirrors, there is a corridor of diminishing images that moves on as far as you can see. And it seems as though you are looking into eternity. That double effect into infinity of the mirrors is such a glorious expression of the way in which Mormon theology uh, transcends the generations and the, uh, and the, uh, the marriage for eternity and uh, eternity both backwards and forwards, so to say, in uh, which in, in a very simple way is a, uh, is a mighty simple. And the things that are eternal in the temple are our families and our family relationships that link us together as far back as we can go and as far forward as we can think. We live in mortal life and we live together in love and children are born to us and then in due time when uh, we reach mature years, as is the case with everyone, Eventually, the spirit and the body are separated in the process we call death, and one by one we go through the veil. But there we will assemble. And uh, in due course, our children and their children and their children come, and uh, those family ties are intact. It's a marvelous thing. Man could not have invented that. It's uh, come by revelation, a supernal idea. I don't know how to speak about heaven in the traditional lovely, paradisical beauty that we speak of heaven 
I wouldn't know how to speak of heaven without my wife or my children. It would, it would not be heaven for me. Now, you can say that's wishful thinking, or you can say that's just because you love each other and you've gotten cozy here on earth and you like each other's company. It's a lot more than that. There is something eternal in the statement that neither is the man without the woman nor the woman without the man in the Lord. That isn't just good sociology. That is theology. It's eternal. In the temple, we do things for ourselves, but basically we do things uh, for others. One of the sacred ordinances of the temple is baptism for the dead, so that uh, we perform baptisms for and in behalf of those who have lived before. 1 Corinthians 15, uh, where Paul speaks about those who baptize themselves for the dead, and uh, obviously takes for granted that A, there were people who did so, and he has no complaint about it. Now, with the Mormons, we have it again as a practice. Professor Christer Stendhal of Harvard Divinity School became the Bishop of Stockholm in Sweden. During a visit we made there, he called a press conference, invited uh, various of his friends, and then said the following. He said, I have three rules for interfaith discussion. To wit, number one, if you're going to ask the question, what do others believe in their various faiths? Ask them, not their critics, not their enemies. Because what one religious tradition says about another is usually a breach against the commandment, thou shalt not bear false witness. Number two, if you're going to compare, don't compare your bests with their worsts but compare bests with bests. Most people think of their own tradition as, as it is at its best, and they use caricatures of the others. And then number three, he said, leave room for holy envy. And then he said, let me give you an example of my holy envy for the Latter-day Saints. We Lutherans, when we lose our loved ones, we have funerals, we have cemeteries. But that ends our concern with those who have gone before. But the Latter-day Saints care about their forebears to the point that they want to bring the blessings of Christ's atonement to them. So they build temples and according to Paul's instruction in 1 Corinthians, they perform baptisms for the dead. And then he smiled and said, I have holy envy for that. In a world where we finally have learned what I call the holy envy, uh, it's a beautiful thing. I could think of myself as taking part in such an act extending the blessings that have come to me in and through Jesus Christ. That's generous, that's beautiful, and should not be, uh, yeah, ridiculed or, or spoken badly of. One of the principal things anyone would say about our temple experience and our temple work being a continuation of, but larger, than earlier ancient temple work is that this overwhelming component for the dead that could only begin with Christ's death and resurrection. He goes and opens the lock on the prison door for the dead. We do vicarious work in the temple. That's an interesting word. It's, uh, people wonder, well, how can you do that? Vicarious work, that means doing something for and in behalf of uh, someone else. Can you really be baptized for someone else? Christ's whole ministry was vicarious. He has, the atonement was vicarious. He did it for and on behalf of all who have ever lived. 
So he was acting for and in behalf of every human soul. So the vicarious work is a, a standard that is uh, as legitimate and sound as can be. One way or another, every prophet has taught that God is no respecter of persons, that we are all his children, that there is ultimately in eternity, there is no distinction in race or color or circumstance or geography or whatever, uh, and that he loves us all. It just seems to me the most logical thing in the world. If you just want to talk about being reasonable, if you just want to talk about being fair, if justice is any kind of an issue here, then, then every child of God has to have the opportunity for salvation, for the gifts of the Savior, for his atonement, which was a vicarious experience. It is the central thesis of Christianity that Jesus Christ did for us something we could not do for ourselves. He both represented us and he did something that affects us as if we had done it. That's the way we receive deliverance from sin and transgression. And that's the way we receive the becoming process of overcoming even sinfulness until we no longer have the habits and or the desires for sin. That's a vicarious act the Savior, the Redeemer, does for us. That's a beautiful way of letting the eternal mix into the temporal, which in a way is what Christianity is about. That's the idea of proxy service as Christ exhibits it, becomes something we, in our limited way, can do for each other. That's both true love and true joy. It's a very moving thing because if I understand it right, it is very family-oriented, producing the best genealogical material that the world has ever seen. It's family values to the hilt. We trace our family lines first and are baptized for our progenitors, and that is for and in their behalf. All of the sacred service offered in the temples is accomplished by making covenants with God. Anciently, the children of Israel were given the law to live by, and God, on several occasions, had them make covenants with him to live that law. Well, the ideal covenant people are people who realize that they have an agreement with God, and that agreement obligates them. And the obligation cannot be thrown off when it's inconvenient, for example, when it's difficult. For example, Jews were persecuted and gave their lives rather than give up their religion. So covenant is a, a from God's point of view, an unbreakable agreement. At our end, the human element, we are supposed to commit ourselves and to do so in a solemn way. That is the central unifying principle of the temple, to bring people together in a covenant relationship. But the whole undergirding premise of a temple is that a covenant that is fully binding means, first of all, you must bring yourself in faith. The scriptural phrase is a broken heart and a contrite spirit, both Old and New Testament phrase. Then also it should be done in the most solemn way, which means in the presence of witnesses then also it must be done in a dedicated space where all worldly influences and all distractions are removed and where you can therefore even sense that you're doing this with divine approval even as it were in the presence of angelic hosts and then finally it is to be done in his name to a great extent the temple is the spiritual center, or for us the synagogue today, of such a covenantal community. So covenant is realized through action. Again, ritual action, but remembering also that ritual action is designed to teach moral and ethical action. The uh, expression, a covenant people, appears in our literature and in scriptural literature that they are people of the covenant simply meaning they are those with whom the Lord has made agreements and they have made agreements with the Lord. They become his people. This is why Latter-day Saints are building temples all over the world. 
they are obeying the commandments of God to worship him in his holy house, to receive great blessings of eternal life, and to create eternal families, both for themselves and for their ancestors. Historically, the building of temples in various parts of the world, sometimes initially opposed because initially misunderstood, have become a great source of pride. Someone who does not know much about temples and Mormons building temples should be directed to the Bible. Since the earthly temple is built after the model of heavenly temple, it literally brings down to earth a piece of heaven. The lights that are on the temple at night are symbolic of the feeling that there is, that there's a light in the center of our neighborhood. It's a place of peacefulness, a place of calm. It's a place of great beauty. It is not like a huge, say, uh, football stadium where on days of the event uh, the place is mobbed, there are cars from here to the end of the earth and terrible traffic jams. Instead, there are modest people who come at intervals uh, during the day and where one can sense there is something going on that is sweet and sacred and soothing. This temple is on a mountain, <laughs> uh, which can be seen from very far away. It's beautifully placed. Uh, its marble is exquisite. It is a lovely addition to our landscape here. The LDS Temple in Portland is, in my opinion, one of the most magnificent architectural structures in the world. It is truly a magnificent, beautiful, glorious piece of architecture. There's a special spirit there even before it's dedicated. After it's dedicated, it becomes a very holy place to the members of the church, and they treat it with great reverence. I feel very positively, and have done all the time, and I would share that positive feeling with other people. For those who have lived near such buildings, and who are our friends, though not of our faith, they are the ones to consult, to ask the question, should we be willing to have one in our neighborhood? And the verdict overall would be, you should. When. Uh a temple is ready for dedication, then it's open. We have tours through the temple, and anyone can come and go through the temple, and in most cases, thousands of people go through the temple. We literally, literally throw open the doors of the temple to say, come one, come all. Those who are not of our faith are openly invited to attend, and it is the great hope of the church that they would attend and feel welcome in being there. We just love to have young and old come and uh, see what a temple is, see the, you know, the way they're built, uh, feel the spirit, uh, f respond to the beautiful setting, and uh, that way know a little bit more about us, just know a little bit more about what a temple is in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. After the open house, a temple is dedicated and is then closed to the public. We dedicate the temples to the Lord, and on each temple you will see engraven on the, uh, the facade of the temple, holiness to the Lord. It's his house. His spirit is there, and we go there to be close to him. Since the temple is a meeting place between heaven and earth, the main characteristic of heaven is holiness. The Hebrew word, kadosh, holy, means basically separated. So for example, the notion of marriage is kiddushin. This man and woman are separated to be together, apart from others. Now, this separateness means that there is something here in that which is holy, which is very special. But the specialness here comes from the idea of the presence of God. Holiness is a, an an intensification of the good up to the goodness of God. Holiness is not only something to be entered, it's something to be taken home. And if you don't take it home, it's all a waste of time. The beauty of holiness is an old biblical phrase. 
And here is an understanding of beauty of holiness, not in a churchy matter, but just in terms of a very beautiful place in which to be. It's quite unique. I know of no other religious tradition that, uh, that has engendered that uh, symbolism. No unclean thing can enter in the presence of God. And uh, we know that he is holy and that to be in his presence is to be in a holy place. And holiness means that uh, we are clean and pure, that whatever tarnish was on us has been erased through the atonement and that we can enter into his presence. I can go to the temple and feel close to God. I can feel holiness. And if I'm lacking in that for whatever reason on any given day, I can go and do a little better as a result of that. I can go and try to mend my ways and improve and promise and uh, repent and fortify. And I can leave uh, strengthened for the journey. Temple is a great comfort, and another thing a temple is it's quiet. Pretty hard to find any place that's quiet in the world anymore. And uh, members often will go to the temple when they're in stress, when they're mourning, or when they have challenges. Because they can go there in a place that's totally sacred. The reverence is a reverence that allows you to ponder and meditate and think and feel, and so it's the source of great comfort. We all need first aid. We all need uh, an infusion every now and again. Uh, we all need hope and help and holiness. And the temple does all of that for me. Often, members of the church will go to the temple with the very vexing problem that they have no idea what they'll do with it. And as they go to the temple and go through the ceremonies there, then it's as the scriptures say, the voice of the Lord comes into their mind. And what was not solvable becomes solvable. We're able to do that because Jesus is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. This is his church, and those are his temples. And he is all that we declare him to be, the light and the life of the world.